you welcome everyone to our webinar ODAR assessment toolkit um, unfortunately Nick Jones is now unable to present this webinar today um, but his colleague Paul has kindly stepped in to present I do apologize, apologize for the change in speaker but I'm certain Paul will provide a very interesting presentation Paul Otley is a pre principal consultate, cons consultant at All for Sense UK um, formerly ODANET and a recognized UK expert in odor assessment and control. He has approximately 20 years experience in the field of environmental assessment and regulation, including 16 years focusing exclusively on odor related issues as a specialist consultant. He is an expert in odor monitoring and analysis techniques and is a level two qualified in the Environment Agency Stack Emission and Monitoring MSERT scheme. He is also an expert in the application of mathematical dispersion models focusing on AirMod. He is an experienced expert witness and has provided expert advice to several cases relating to pl planning and permitting issues. Um, this webinar will provide an overview of the current state of the art in, in terms of the techniques and tools available to assist environmental practitioners to assess odour impact for planning, perm permitting, permitting or nuisance investigation pur pur purposes. As always, there will be the chance for questions at the end of the presentation, so please do submit these in the Q&A option at the, at the bottom of your screen at any point during the presentation. I will then ask these on your behalf later on. Thank you for logging in and I will now hand over to Paul. Brilliant. Thank you very much for the introduction. So yes, the purpose of my presentation today is to provide an overview of the tools that are available to measure odours, um, to, to assess odour problems, and hopefully to find solutions to these odour problems. There's, there's a fair range of tools available, and really the tool that is selected is dependent on, on what's involved, um, and the kind of the overall objective of what you're trying to achieve. Um, the tools can be used, different tools can be used by different people from operators, regulators, or specialist environmental consultants. Sometimes the tools are used individually, but more often than not, they are used in combination. Um, so jumping straight in, um, loaders like most environmental pollutants, um, the factors that influence whether a problem occurs relates to the source pathway receptor model. Um, the key elements of this, for, so for odour sources, the key relevant points really are the strength of the odour, its character, its offensiveness, and quite often its chemical composition. Um, the factors that influence the pathway, that's basically how, how the odour um, gets from release point to receptor. Uh, two key, key elements really, the atmospheric dispersion that it receives, the dilution it receives once released, and the distance of the receptor from the, from the odour source. And then the factors which can affect the receptor, well these are sometimes a bit more difficult to, to quantify, but um, the key kind of elements are the sensitivity of the receptor <clears throat> in terms of um, not so much human sensitivity, sense of smell, but in terms of um, people's expectation on the, the quality of the environment that they're in. Uh, the context, odour exposure, history, the perception towards the odour source, whether it's negative or, or positive perception of that um, source that's causing the odour. And then, of course, we um, have a number of tools, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, there are a number of tools that can be applied at each stage. Um, in basic terms, at the source, uh, the, key, the key tool is odour measurement, measuring the odours, whether that's the, the character or the nature, all that kind of stuff we've discussed. Um, pathway, the main tools, well, two categories really. Firstly, the fairly relatively simplistic um, qualitative risk assessments and much more detailed atmospheric dispersion modelling. And then in terms of the receptors, we can use tools such as odour complaints records, the kind of passive tools, and then the more active tools, so the odour diaries, um, sniff testing appraisals can be undertaken and kind of more detailed plume appraisals can also be used. So jumping in in a bit more detail then, starting with the source-based tools. Um, these fall into the category of sensory tools and molecular tools. Um, so sensory measurement in basic terms uses the human nose, um, describes the odour in human terms, typically applied, uh, well it can be applied at the source itself um, or at the receptor and molecular measurements um, could be undertaken. This is, this is basically measurements of, of a compound that's contributing to the odour using 
electrical instruments, um, describes the odour in chemical terms. These can be used again, both in at source or at receptor applications, but much more commonly applied in measuring the, the chemicals and the odours from the source itself. So in terms of the sensory assessments, so those which use the human nose, um, there's four broad categories really, or, or four, four key elements to this. Firstly is the odour concentration, uh, which, is, which is basically a, an objective measure of how strong it is. The intensity is the perceived strength, but when it actually is experienced by the receptor. The hedonic tone, um, how pleasant it is or isn't, and the character, what it actually smells like. So I'll just touch on each of those in a little bit more detail now. Um, odour concentration is measured, like I say, using uh, olfactometry. It is an objective, standardised method. Um, practitioners use the um, 13725 British standard or European standard for olfactometry. It's undertaken it under very controlled environment using trained panellists and essentially an odour from the source in question, whether it's a sewage treatment works or a stack at an industrial site bag samples of odour are collected and brought back to the laboratory where they're presented through a dilution machine called an olfactometer to a panel of trained odour assessors. The measurement unit, the, the concentration is measured in odour units. Um, I think most, most people these days are familiar with that, but for those that aren't, one odour unit is the point where the odour is barely detectable, perhaps just about detectable to roughly half of the normal sensitivity population and a, a sample of a thousand odour units would require dilution with clean odour-free air a thousand times prior to it being reaching the level at which it's, it's at the same undetectable borderline detectable level. Olfactometry is applied to assess compliance to regulatory emission limits. Um, most commonly it's probably used to quantify odour emissions for using dispersion modelling, so gathering source data for dispersion models. Can also be used to directly assess the performance of odour abatement systems and biofilters and scrubbers and the like. And it's always undertaken by specialists. Um, the odour intensity, this is a measure of the, I guess the, the phrase I think is the perceived strength of the odour. Um, typically use a scale of zero to six is used. This is presented in the Environment Agency H4 document with zero being no odour detectable and six being an extremely strong odour. Um, again, direct sensory appraisal by a human, it can be done in the laboratory or field, and it's to assess the odour strength at the receptor. Hedonic tone, that's a bit more subjective. It's really just a, a perception of an appraiser as to whether the smell is pleasant or unpleasant, and the scale is minus four up to plus four. Um, can be done in a lab or in the field, um, and so what one output from it is if you're doing dispersion modelling and you, you need to decide which odour impact criteria to use, information such as the offensiveness of the odour can be used to, to give an indication of where you might apply a suitable criteria or how you choose that criteria. And the final element of, of this is the character or quality and that in basic terms is just simply a case of what the odour smells like. Again assessed by direct appraisal using a set of standardised descriptors. Um, and that can be applied in the laboratory or in the ambient field environment. This, uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of its application, it's used to di differentiate different types of odours in the field, um, particularly if you've got odours odors from different facilities that are causing a problem, um, it's a pretty useful tool. And again, it can be used in helping determine the performance of an odour abatement system in terms of um, the, the character of the odour that's presented to the system and emitted from the system can be very useful in, in diagnosing when the system isn't doing its job. Okay, so those are the sensory techniques. The next techniques are the molecular analysis techniques. Um, so there's three broad classifications here. Firstly, odour surrogates. Secondly, GCMS, gas chromatography mass spectroscopy and GC olfactometry, which is a, a relatively new, not hugely widely, widely used approach at the moment. Um, but we'll talk about each of those now in a little bit more detail. So odour surrogate measurements. Um, I mean, this is typically, this is the measurement of a compound, a surrogate compound that can be easily measured. Um, 
it it's, can be applied to gases. So most commonly we see this applied for hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, kind of odorous gases, which can be taken to be a, a, a good indication of, of whether odour levels uh, are going up or going down. It's, it's about trending it without the need to actually undertake repeated um, olfactometry, which is fairly resource and cost expensive. Um, it can also be applied to liquids. So in the case of sewage, uh, dissolved sulphide can be taken as a surrogate for potential odour release from a particular, particular sewage. Um, it tends to be applied to understand how the odour strength can vary with time. So again, a, a typical study might be to undertake olfactometry at, at one point in time, perhaps a, a 10 minute sample. But if you can then tra tra trend one of the key odorous compounds such as hydrogen sulfide over say a day or a week, and you can kind of build up an understanding of the relationship between the two, you can get a real good indication of how strength of the odor might change over time. Uh, again, odor control systems, well, this is a useful tool to, to work out whether the odor control system's consistently performing or whether it suffers from spikes, peaks in odor release that, that might not be detected through spot sampling. Uh, and then finally, uh, odor mapping, a very simple tool, um, odor mapping to event, identify key emission sources. Um, an important point to point out is that surrogates rarely ever replace the need for sensory analysis using our factometry. They uh, are usually used in combination to build up as, as good a picture as you can of the, the odor situation. So GCMS, GCMS is the characterization of the odor in terms of specific chemical compounds. Um, volatile organic compounds are captured on a sorbent tube or in a bag, so usually collected at source, um, put into a bag and then onto a sorbent tube, and they're presented to the um, GC for separation to its individual compounds, and then those pass through the MS for quantification. So the output is a, is a reading of what compounds are present and in what quantity. In terms of the applications, this tends to be used for diagnosing performance problems with odour treatment systems. Um, usually if an odour treatment system is not working very well, if we take uh, GCMS samples on the inlet and outlet, you can get a good indication of which chemical compounds are removed by the system and which are breaking through and which ones are causing, causing the, the outlet problem odours. Um, can also be used to assess health impacts. So concerns are often raised about if something smells bad, as the chances are the compounds there are going to be causing some, some damage or some health problems. So this is a way to quantify what compounds are there and then assessments on health can be undertaken. And of course, the data can be used to help select or actually design odor control systems. Um, so the last of these, GC sniffing, like I say, it's a fairly new technique. This is the simultaneous assessment of odour in both chemical and sensory terms. So essentially it's a GCMS system, <coughs> excuse me, with um, a sniffing port on the end of the, of the machine. So as, the, as each compound is separated by the GC, its character or intensity or hedonic tone can be appraised um, by the human assessor. This is actually quite a useful tool because um, it, it allows the main chemical contributors to be assessed in human perception terms. So rather than simply getting a list of all chemicals, compounds present, you get somebody at the end that's saying, well, of all those compounds that came through, the most unpleasant or the most notable was this particular one. And you can sometimes correspond that to descriptions of what the odor complaint or what the odor issue is. Um, and also sometimes some compounds won't be detectable using conventional GCMS, because if there isn't a, a reference, um, a reference data set for that particular compound, it might not show up, even though it can be extremely smelly. So, yeah, so that, those are the key kind of odour measurement techniques. Um, moving on now to the tools that we can apply to actually assess how once released, those odours are actually going to be um, diluting and dispersing or potentially causing impact. The, the I guess the two can kind of approaches are the qualitative risk-based assessments, such as the one presented in the IAQM Ode Guidance for Planning. Um, that's a kind of a predictive assessment tool. Um, having said that, it can also be used for existing situations. Um, and then also the more complex uh, dispersion modeling approaches, um, so your AMOD and your ADMS, and then 
perhaps again a slightly newer technology um, a new software, there's a software called Autelium, which can be used for, for real-time dispersion modeling. Um, if we just go through each one of those in turn. So the first one is the risk assessment matrix. Um, the approach, I've, I've just taken a printout straight from the IAQM ODA guidance here. Uh, essentially, it's an impact assessment predictive to predict what level of ODA impact um, is likely to occur from a certain um, facility and it's a qualitative approach but essentially it's a case of making an assessment of the source odor potential so how, how much odor is likely to be released from the source and an assessment of how effective the pathway is likely to be once that source is released and then it's it's just a case of, of using the risk matrices that are presented in the document and uh, to come up with a, a kind of level of risk it's quite often used as a screening set assessment prior to um, dispersion modeling, if it's found that dispersion modeling is needed in, you know, in the case of more um, high risk activities. So, the more complex um, approach for assessing uh, the pathway is to use dispersion models. The most common type, which I, I expect most people on the, on the call are familiar with, is your steady state dispersion models. These tend to be, I mean, most commonly used is AMOD and ADMS. These models in the field of odour assessment, these models are long term models and they use, they run for typically three to five years um, using hourly meteorological data to make an assessment of what the long term risk of odour impact from either an existing or a proposed facility is likely to be. Um, so the example we can see there is those are odour impact contours generated from a sewage treatment works. Um, and that particular study was used to assess the risk of impact at a proposed development site, which is the kind of pinky purple uh, hatched area. So, the, I mean, the, so the key applications of that kind of assessment um, can also be used perhaps where a proposed facility is likely to be odorous. So, a, you know, a, a new chicken production facility, dispersion modeling can be undertaken to assess the risk to existing receptors. Um, can also undertake assessments of how effective an abatement scheme might be at an existing facility, and also to understand what the relative contribution from different sources within an existing facility might be. Um, the model outputs that are produced are 98th percentile hourly average outputs, and there are certain published, fairly well established odour impact criteria that are applied to give a judgment on whether the proposed level of risk is acceptable or not. So the most commonly applied are those presented in the Environment Agency H4 ODA guidance, which was published back in 2011, and the IAQM ODA guidance for planning, which was released uh, originally in 2014 and 2018. So these essentially look at the level of ODA exposure that's predicted by the models and takes into account the sensitivity of the receptor to then make a judgment on whether the risk of impact is likely to be negligible, slight, moderate or substantial. Um, so those, that's a fairly widely applied tool and there's, there are all kinds of um, discussions about the different techniques and um, you know, way, ways of using dispersion modelling. Well, I think we've covered the, the key elements there. A slightly more, I guess, again, slightly more advanced or certainly more um, continuous way of uh, modelling is to use um, continuous plume systems. Um, now, what these do is they, they kind of give a much more, rather than the long term impact that's predicted over a five year period, they can give, you know, hourly predictions to give an indication of how things at a given facility may change on an hourly basis in terms of um, odour impact at nearby facilities. Essentially, it's a risk management tool um, that allows you or allows the operator to make a judgment, make an assessment of how um, odour impact risk is increasing or decreasing. And that's a value to operators because it may affect the uh, timing of certain odorous operations. So it may be that cl uh, cleaning out a particular odorous tank is not a good idea when the weather conditions mean that the level of impact is predicted to be extremely large. Um, 
So that's kind of a, a it's a much finer resolution model. Again, that can be applied using steady state models like the AMOS and AMOD and ADMS. But there is also potential to use more um, detailed models, more complex models such as CalPuff, which kind of use a, a, high, a much lower time factor in terms of the, uh, the model predictions rather than hourly averages. And then the final element of um, modeling is something called back trajectory um, analysis. This is a tool that tends to be used for sourcing or determining what the source of a particular odor complaint may be. Um, so the example here, the, the yellow sort of star sun type image uh, figure in the middle of the image is the location at which the complaint has been received. Um, and the model is set up to take account of the meteorological conditions at the time of the complaint, along with topography, um, buildings, all that kind of information. And what it can then do is make an assessment or a prediction of the most likely source of that, uh, of the odour, where the odour is likely to be generated. Um, as with all these tools that, you know, the better the quality of the data that's in there, the better the quality of the met data, the more representative, the, the higher confidence can be had in the, in the model output and the prediction of where that source was derived. But I've got a case study later on that, that involves um, indicating where that tool was, was used. Okay, so those are the main pathway assessment tools. And then at the other end of the, of the process, we've got tools that can be applied um, at the receptor. So these techniques are, I guess, four kind of main techniques. The first is analysis of odor complaints data. That's a, that's a passive technique for benchmarking the level of impact that might be experienced at a particular location. Um, there's a lot of caveats involved with early complaints. So um, when reviewing complaint data, a, a bit of kind of quite a good understanding of the situation is, is often required in terms of, um, is it one regular complainment? Is it a, a, a broad spectrum of people complaining? Um, there's a lot of interpretation that, that's required to make sense of early complaint data in our experience. Odor diaries can be used, well, that's more active, same idea, but you're actually asking people uh, a broad area and spread of people to, to provide uh, a view on what the odor situation is. And then there's techniques that can be used by site operators and practitioners and local authority and EA staff. And that's the sniff test, testing and the plume tracking approaches. So I talk about the, the sniff testing approach in a bit more detail. So sniff testing is a tool which again uses human assessors uh, using direct appraisal to determine the, in the intensity, hedonic tone and character of an odour, typically out in the field in the ambient environment. Um, there's obviously a degree of su subjectivity within that because you're using humans to give an opinion on their, their perception of the odour. Um, but there are ways of, you know, you, you can make these assessments more valid and more detailed if you consider, for example, the persistence and duration of odour detection. So if you repeat the assessment on numerous days, um, you can build up a nice strong indication of what the situation in terms of what the odour smells like, how often it occurs. And there, there's guidance in the IAQM uh, odour guidance for planning, particularly on about how you take the frequency and duration and the intensity of the odour into account to give an, uh, a view on whether impacts likely. Um, so it can be used to investigate and corroborate odour complaints. It can be used by site operators to undertake routine monitoring uh, of site locations or site boundaries to, to kind of monitor how their site's doing in terms of odour. And it can be used by regulators to identify sources of odour or assess compliant, compliance to permit conditions. And then an, another type of um, <clears throat> sniffing assessment, slightly more um, advances plume tracking. This is an approach that uses um, <coughs> human assessors, again, usually uh, somewhere between two and 10 people in the field, usually, usually two for practical reasons. Um, this is where an odour plume from a facility, typically a diffuse source facility, is tracked by uh, essentially starting way downwind of the facility and continuously traversing the plume, marking where the odour is and isn't detected. Um, and building up a picture of, of the extent of the plume. 
there's, there is a reference method for this tool. It's 16841, it's the BSEN standard, um, and that, that is available for use and that is applied in some fairly uh, large projects, particularly where the odor source is difficult to pinpoint. So um, diffuse sources such as a landfill. Um, as with a lot of these things, that the more measurements that are undertaken, the more confidence we can have in the results that it produces. So, so as usual, the more testing, the better. Okay, so the last element of this is, is two case studies, some, some real world case studies I thought would be of, of value and interest to present. The first relates to uh, a, a mystery odour from a sewage treatment plant up in Scotland. Um, a little bit of context on the situation. The complaints were originating uh, about odours from the plant from about 200 metres downwind of the site. Um, but peculiarly for, for a sewage treatment works, the complaints were of a meaty and rubber type odour um, rather than an intermittent odour. Now, this, if you know sewage treatment works, you know it tends to be the sulphurous, um, really unpleasant, uh, reduced sulphur compound smells that generate complaints, but it was the unusual meaty rubber situation here. And people were also concerned uh, about the health implications of, of these smells, where these smells can be causing them some harm. And unusually, the on-site investigation by the operator found there was no trace of these odours actually on the site itself. Um, so investigations were undertaken and the possible sources were identified as the CHP, uh, the biogas pressure release and the siloxane filter recharge. The highest concentration was measured from the, from the biogas and from the siloxane filter recharge. Uh, what was very notable on this situation is that the character of the odour changed quite substantially with dilution. So there's some very, very high odour concentration uh, samples were collected, but when these were presented to, to panellists at different dilutions, the nature of the smell was reported as differently. So, so at the lower dilutions, that the purged air from the siloxane filter was described as a biogassy sulfurous cabbage smell. But when this odour was diluted down substantially, the description changed to a gravy and savoury meaty type smell. Um, so that was a fairly useful tool to work out how the odour might change once released. And then the, the GCO technique I talked about earlier was used to identify the specific odorous compounds which were causing that issue. And again, somebody had the, the pleasure of sitting at the end of the GC machine and sniffing the samples as they came through and two specific compounds were identified uh, that related to this meaty rubber smell. And dispersion modelling was used to confirm that these sources were likely the cause and the health assessment itself indicated that there was no risk at the, the concentrations of these compounds that people were exposed to. And then the solution uh, was found, there were, there were two options. Firstly, to retrofit a burner to the back of the filter to, to destroy all of the compounds as they were released. Um, and alternatively, to replace the filter with a non-regenerating alternative that didn't result in these intermittent emission sources. So that's case study one. Case study two relates to uh, an investigation, a much kind of larger scale investigation of, of an odour with no obvious source. So this was, um, complaints were reported from a wide area across a European city. Um, the complaints specifically related to the perception of a distinctive cat urine smell. And the odours were intermittent and were found to be very difficult to trace. Um, being a large city, there were lots of different potential odour sources spread over a large area. A number of tools were used for this. The, the first was back trajectory modelling uh, in combination with sniff testing. And this identified a car spraying facility and an associated wastewater treatment works, uh, which served the facility as the likely source of the odours. Uh, the cat urine odours were detected in the recirculated water from the car spraying plant. And a literature, literature review pointed towards something called cat ketone, which is a, a, a compound with a very low odour threshold. Um, and the GCMS that was undertaken identified that the, there were precursors to the cat ketone compound within odour samples that were collected from the wastewater treatment works. Um, so at that point, it became very clear that that was where this source that had been blighting the, the city had originated from. And the solution, well, the operator simply enhanced the hygiene levels in the water recirculation to eliminate the formation of odorous compounds, and that soon solved the problem. <laughs>
So I think, yeah, so that, that's, that's a very quick tour through all the various tools that are available. Um, and so just to summarize that the toolkit is there and it's adaptable to different types of odor problem. Um, the key is to ensure that the, the design of the, the survey or the tools you're gonna to apply have to be designed appropriately to meet the, the objective and the target of the study. As with a lot of things, a combination of tools is usually the preferred method of, of solving the problems. And a lot of the time, expert interpretation is often required, particularly for the more problematic, more difficult um, problems. Um, and finally, new, new tools are becoming available um, as the science of odour assessment and odour measurement develops. Um, and I'm sure that we'll see in the coming years more and more uh, new additional tools be put into, into, into action. So that's, that's the end of the presentation and thank you for listening. Thanks, Paul, that was really insightful. And just going to Q&A, um, we've got a couple. I'm sure we won't be able to get through all of them, but um, okay. I'll give them a go. Uh, so where does the action threshold come from? Guidance or is it based on site-specific requirements? Um, so the, so the action threshold, if we're talking about in, in modeling, oh, sorry, in, in odor impact terms, the threshold at which um, action is required to be taken, it, it's all about the, the published odor impact criteria. Um, so, so for a permitted site, there may be a condition requiring you to achieve a certain odor level at your site boundary. Um, in planning terms, there's published guidance on what level of odor impact or sorry, odor exposure is acceptable at off-site receptors. And those levels are published, yeah, in, in the H4 Environment Agency guidance it is the one that's most relevant to permitting. And from a planning perspective, it's the IAQM odor guidance for planning, which I would, I would point out it's not statutory guidance, but what it is, it's the, it's the most commonly applied and I would say the best available reference um, document and it's probably the one that the planning system relies on the most. Okay. Um, next one is, how do the results from GC olfa olfactometer compare with the established odour detection limits for individual comp compounds? And can you use the GC method for non-organic compounds, e.g. H2S and NH3? Um, it can't be used for non-organic compounds, I believe. That's a very good question. I, I'm, I'm not a GC method expert. Um, but sorry, can you just give me the first part of the question again, if you if you would? Sure. Uh, how do the results from GC olf olfactometer compare with the established odor detection limits for individual compounds? Ah, right. I see. Um, I, I think in the specific example we were talking about um, for the for the European city example. Um, to be honest, it all depends on whether the, the compound that's causing the problem has an established odour threshold value. So, so lots of compounds are well known and there's an established odour threshold value. GCO comes in, into its own where it's a compound that isn't known particularly and doesn't have a published odour threshold value. And then it's a case of for standard GC, the compound would have come through the GC without being registered as a particular problem because nobody understands that compound as being a problem because the operator was sat at the back for the GCO process doing the sniffing, they managed to identify um, this, this compound um, and, and come up with a, an indication of what, what type of smell it was and what kind of odour it was causing. Um, so, so I don't know if, it, if I quite answered the question there, but the, both have got applications um, and it, it tends to be the trickier more unknown, unusual compounds that warrant the use of the GCO as opposed to the standard GC approach. Okay. Um, next one. Uh, is anyone in the UK providing screening tests to determine if individuals have a suitable sensitivity to partake in sniff testing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we do at Alpha Sense. We've got a laboratory in Bristol and one in Northwich, I think Greater Manchester. Um, where we, well, we undertake screening of our odour panellists, so the people who are going to work on the olfactometer have their sense of smell tested to use uh, the olfactometer to be used in the accredited analysis. But we also regularly test uh, local authority officers and environment agency officers and um, operators, uh, any, anybody who has a need to know consultants, there, anyone who needs to know 
to prove that they have a, a sensory acuity that's within the normal range um, can be tested at, at whole factometry laboratories. Um, I should add other labs are available as well. Okay. Um, with the Ortelium continuous real-time monitoring, what's the challenge with entering varying data such as concentration, weather condition, emission factor, uh, etc.? Are the data entry done manually or automated as the condition changes with time? Um, either. I mean, the, the more the more time and effort and energy is invested in entering that kind of data, the, the better the result. So I guess the simplified way of doing it is you, you understand what the baseline odour emissions from a facility are, and you kind of plumb that into the model elements of it, and then you're just relying on the weather data to give you an update to give you the predictions. But you can certainly incorporate, um, let's say, uh, for a site that's generating a lot of hydrogen sulphide, you can incorporate hydrogen sulphide monitors at, on the various sources, so your key emission points, you can install meters there. And obviously, if they detect an increase in, in H2S, they can adjust the model setting to, to, to turn up the odor emission effectively. Um, so you can certainly take it to, to a fairly detailed level. Um, and that can be done automatically with sensors, or indeed, if, if you know, if you've got a kind of baseline set of data that tells you when our production level runs at 10%, this is our emission. When we run at 90%, this is our emission. Um, somebody could manually type in, over the next 24 hours, we're gonna be running at 90%, let the model demonstrate what the, uh, the impact will be based on that increased emission rate and the, uh, the MET data that's predicted for that time. Right, okay. Um, is it common to use CFD instead of AirMod or ADMS when modeling odor impacts? It's certainly not common. Um, and the reason for that is, is odor, odor impact, for, for anything like regulatory or planning, odor impact is um, assessed over the long term. So, so it's model predictions of what the long-term situation is likely to be. Um, and the odour impact criteria, the standards that are used, are all generally based on the, these long-term models and the long-term predictions. Um, CFD certainly has a place, though, in things like, I, I guess, more sporadic, intermittent or complex situations. And a really good example is we've got a project on where we have a waste site um, that, that generally is it all contained and doesn't let very much odour out, but when the doors open um, to let trucks in and out, a, a big kind of release of odour occurs. So we've looked at the possibility of using um, CFD modelling to give us uh, an indication of what the short term model imp uh, uh, odour impact from that is likely to be, or, or certainly a short, a short term indication of where the odours from that are going to travel, how far they're going to go and what the odour level is likely to be. So the technology is certainly there to do it, as we know, and it, and it can certainly have an application. The challenge is then determining what level of odour you say, yes, that's going to cause an impact or no, that isn't, because you can't simply refer back to your 98th percentile published values because you're not experiencing that odour for a year. Mm. So in summary, yeah, cer certainly has a place increasingly um, and uh, just requires some kind of deep thought into how to interpret the results. Great. Um, are, there, are there measures taken to make sure that smelling or sniffing a sample is safe? Yeah, 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 absolutely. We, um, I mean, anyone who operates an accredited laboratory in accordance with the European standard is audited on their procedures and there's a, there's a big section in there about health and safety. And I mean, the, the, very, the very nature of direct uh, dilution of optometry is that the samples are dil diluted hugely before they're presented to the panel. Um, because we want to get it right down to the level where it's barely detectable. So by inherently, you are presenting very, very diluted samples. But yeah, no, nothing would, should be allowed through the olfactometry um, system without an understanding being gained of what the compounds are likely to be. And then if you know which compounds are there and what kind of concentrations they're likely to be, it's, it's a fairly simple exercise to look up the safety, safety exposure level for that compound and check that it's going to receive enough dilution with a sufficient safety factor to ensure that when these odor panelists um, sniff it, they're not going to come to any harm. Um, are any of these tools appropriate for assessing odor risk from, from say volatile hydrocarbons in soils or groundwater? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's all about um, 
Yeah, I mean, there, there are several tools for that. Contaminated land sites have been involved in a couple of projects. Um, and actually, you can use a range of, range of tools for those. You, you can use off-site sniffing assessments. Um, you, you can measure the odours on-site as well. It, it's, it's the same as any odour source. You, you undertake a direct measurement of what the odour emission rate from, from that source is. So contaminated land, you know, a pile of contaminated soil, we can physically place a sampling hood on top of the soil, collect odour samples and analyse to determine what the odour emission rate was at the source. And then that information gets put into a model along with dimensions of how much area of contamination there is. And that can be modelled to, to give an indication of what the current level is. Um, and, and we can also do modelling from, you know, if there's treatment plant involved in cleaning up the soil, um, if we can gather odour and odour emission rate information for those, we can we can model that. Um, so yeah, so I, I you know it, I think it, it's generally speaking it's the same as any other source. The, the key is to quantify what the odour emission rate is, gain an understanding of how it varies over time, and then either model or sometimes off-site sniffing assessments can be applied. Okay, and one last question as we're uh, coming close to the end. Uh, ketone case. Uh, the CAT ketone case study was very interesting. Any idea of how far from the source the receptors' complaints were received? Uh, no, I mean I, it, it was in it was in Barcelona, um, and yeah, I mean it made the national made the national news, certainly the local news, because lar large areas of the city were complaining and experiencing this this CAT urine odor. Um, it, this, the project was done by our um, our Spanish counterparts at the time so I don't I don't have the specific details but it was it wasn't a local area it was a, it was a large area was experienced this horrible odor okay great thank you um so that is it from us today attendees thank you for logging in I hope you found that beneficial and informative don't forget to record your attendance at this webinar in the IES CPD tool you can do this by by logging into the members area this webinar has been recorded and will be made available on the IES website and YouTube channel. If you're watching the recording on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel, like the video and hit the bell to gain notifications of new content.